considered, you will be guaranteed to get one artwork in the exhibition. And that's gonna be our big summer show. Um, who went to the opening for Around the Bend the first time around in the room? Did anyone? It was off the chain. I mean, it was, it was packed. And um, we're planning a lot of different events for Around the Bend that are sort of professional networking events. So it should be a really great, really great opportunity. Please enter. And then we also have a poetry call for entries. So if you're a poet, or even if you're not, I actually entered a poem. I am not a poet. I write bad poetry. But um, the poem should be inspired by a work in our permanent collection. And you can email it to Brandy Bowman, who's standing right over there. And um, who's jurying that? Who juries that? That's uh, Jake Webster and Jake Frank. Awesome. So they'll, they, this is their baby of an event. So they'll jury it, and then we have a really big poetry reading event um, in April. And then your poem will actually go into a chat book that we'll have for free. So those are two call for entries. Um, we're so excited. I'm so excited to introduce David Martin tonight. I knew of David um, by his other name, Half Pint. <laughs> Jag 
Krakow, Skoda Odom, Olawan Niendow. My name is David Martin. Uh, what I said there was my, my Native American name. Um, just a real quick to add to that bio. Um, I'm Potawatomi, Native American. There was never a point in my life where I found out I was Native. I was very lucky to be raised in a functioning tribe. Uh, we always had a land base, a functioning government. My mother basically raised me traditionally. My uncles were all there to get me exposed to the culture. Um, I even, at one point in kindergarten, wet my pants because my mom <laughs> taught me how to say I had to go to the bathroom in Potawatomi and didn't know how to say English. And, uh, yeah, that's how it is sometimes. I'm really, really, really lucky. I started my professional art career in 96 uh, being a tattoo artist. Um, back then I was tattooing out of my house. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, tattooing was illegal in Indiana until 1997. Um, and, and some of you who have been getting tattoos for a long time, you might know about the whole phenomenon about tattoo house parties. That's actually where it comes from, was because there was nowhere else to go unless you went to Michigan. So a lot of us, we had to learn in the house or on the road or wherever we were. Um, when I started thinking about tattooing, my cousin John T had just turned 18. He's the lead singer on our powwow drum. And he had just gotten his Chicago treaty money and he went up to Michigan and got a tattoo. And I myself at the time, I didn't have any tattoos. And I was like, uh, kind of intrigued by what he was doing. And I was actually a, an art school dropout. You know, I, I went to uh, Ivy Tech for art for illustration and uh, got my wife pregnant shortly after. Had to go get like a regular day job, you know, to take care of my family. So when my cousin got this tattoo, he's like, look at this, you know, this guy, he wasn't even drawing this. He was tracing this off a piece of paper and he had a line out the door and you should be doing it. My initial motivation was definitely money. You know, like if you're an artist, it's really hard to make a living doing art and, and just the slightest prospect that you might actually be able to do that for a living, you know, it really, really gives you a little bit of drive and it might start off as something financial, but if you're true to it, eventually it becomes just a way of life for you and the money comes secondary, you know? And my other cousin, uh, Jesse David, shortly after that, he turned 18 and got his money from the government, the Chicago treaty money. He took his money and he bought me my first tattoo equipment out of a tattoo magazine without even asking me or telling me about it. And he was like, look, you can do some practice tattoos on me. And you know, if you like it, awesome, you can keep the equipment. You know, if you don't, you know, you didn't lose any money. Now, I'm telling you this, that's not how you're supposed to do it and you probably shouldn't do it that way. I was in an extreme period of time where, where tattooing was in its, it was in its dark ages. Uh, just around that time period was the first portraits being done where they were realistic, you know, and even back then they weren't realistic on the same level they are now. It, it really was, I, in a lot of ways, I got to see the, the creation of the modern tattoo industry here in town. I spent my first two or three years traveling on the road, powwow to powwow to powwow, and if we had a hotel room for our drum, I would just stay up Saturday night and tattoo all the natives, and, and that's how I learned how to tattoo. Along the way, that tattooing, it, it kind of taught me how to draw on the fly. It filled in a lot of gaps that I, I missed from not going to college. So it's, you could say I'm self-taught, but being a work at art, working artist, it did show me some things, you know, that, that I picked up out of necessity. Not only that, a lot of people, I can say I'm self-taught. I can say, yeah, all these, these paintings and these tattoos on the walls here are, are, are my ideas. But you always have other influences in your life. Mine came from my culture and the people that were around me and the other artists that I was exposed to. Um, I actually had, I have some friends here today and, and some, some peers here today that have like endlessly influenced me. My, my friend here, Vince Bandera, I'm kind of shocked to see him here. I, I, I go years without seeing him. His mother used to babysit me. And when I was in high school, he was going to the Chicago Institute of Art for Animation and, and he used to take me on the South Shore to Chicago and we'd watch the animation festivals that all the students did over there. And like, I remember following this guy, everything he drew was in ballpoint ink pen. He never drew in pencil. And so I thought I had to duplicate that, you know, and it, it forced me to be better. So by the time I went to tattoo, I was already used to putting it down first time, first time right, whether you liked it or not. It was like you had to do it that way. And, and I, I owe it to this guy. Yeah, I, I got, uh, I saw Dale Swampert and Judy Swampert here somewhere. They're my middle school art teachers. I'm like, that's awesome. <laughs> they, I always kept in contact with them. And you know, they, 
they've always supported me in, in any art venture I've ever tried. You know, anything I've ever, even if it ended up going nowhere, they were always really supportive of me. And you know, like, like I said, I can always say these are my ideas and this is my execution, but I wouldn't be here without the support of some of these people. I, I have Eric Weisinger over here. Um, I didn't apprentice him, one of the, the other guys at Bicycle Tattoo apprenticed him. Um, but when he came to Bicycle Tattoo, he brought an artistic creation that put a fire under my butt to push myself even further, you know? You surround yourselves with other artists, creative people, places that you're gonna go, the things that, that will influence what you do. It's really, really important. So I can say I'm self-taught, but really I'm just observant or, or I'm a sponge absorbing the people around me and their inspiration that they give me. As for the art itself, when I first started uh, tattooing, I actually kept the style of tattoo art separate from my native culture. I didn't actually put a connection with those two. Um, I was really heavily focused on doing what was currently trending in the tattoo world. So back then it was like, Tasmanian devil, nautical <laughs> stars, <laughs> micro tribals, you know. Someday maybe that stuff might come back around and be cool again. But uh, that's what I focused on. And at the end of the day, I would go home and do beadwork. You know, my mom taught me to do beadwork so long ago, I actually don't remember her teaching me. I know she did, you know, but she had me doing it right from the get-go. It, it's always been a part of my life. And like all this beadwork I'm wearing on myself, I made it. Some of it, uh, like this tie, I made this when I was 18, and I'm 50 years old, I just turned 50. My mom taught me how to do it right so that it'll last forever, you know? So again, there's that, that influence, you know, that the, the people that come before you, the people around you, how they influence you. Um, at some point, I started watching people that would come in and, and they would want things like Indian princess with like a headdress on, you know? And it's still pretty trendy today. And I was always like, well, you know, when they never wore headdresses, you know, like, I don't know why you have to dress a woman up like that. The way that the women traditionally dressed was probably even more beautiful than the way they're putting them in this headdress, you know? And I never really questioned it too much. I just, I shut up because I didn't want to argue about it. You know, I, a lot of times the client wants what they want. And if they, you don't do it, they'll end up going somewhere else and doing it, you know? And so sometimes, especially in that period of my career, where I wasn't as settled, I wasn't as, as uh, anchored in what I was doing. Um, I just did it, you know? And there was a certain point where my conscience couldn't let me do it anymore, you know? So like when people would come in, they would say, yeah, I wanna get this Indian princess tattoo. And I'd be like, yo, do you want that? Or do you want like a real native tattoo, you know? And my early career, the most of my career, I kind of focused on photorealism, you know, portraits and animals and stuff like that. Well, Potawatomi art is actually really, really abstract. It's, it's floral patterns, leaf patterns, uh, simplified animals, you know. It's actually a whole different way of thinking. And when I started telling these people, these clients that would come in and want these Native American tattoos, I'm like, well, actually, this is a real Native American tattoo, or this is what an actual Potawatomi art area would get. And I was kind of surprised at how many of them were open to it. And I slowly ended up taking all these basically art motifs that I isolated just to my Native American side of life and I started transitioning it over to my tattoo life, it kind of gave my, myself, me personally, it gave myself almost more of a purpose in tattooing. I was no longer just a, I'm gonna do a really cool tattoo, maybe I'll take it to this tattoo convention to see if I can win an award with it or something, or you know, how much money can I make off of this one, or, you know, what, what's, it became a purpose, you know, like, this is, this is my niche. Yeah, I can still do portraits, no problem, you know, but now I can service my people and the people that want to get the wrong version of misrepresentation of my people, I can offer them an authentic version. Sometimes I actually joke and I say it's reverse colonialism. You know, <laughs> nice bring them in and I give them some real native stuff. You know? um, that's how it started. And then with my paintings, I've always, I've always done native style paintings, um, but it always, it started off initially as just commissions. It was, uh, it was admittedly, it was, it was a, a, I don't wanna say cash grab, but it was a way of living and supporting my family. Um, I wasn't a natural oil painter, I didn't teach myself. I spent a good year of just practicing. 
Um, the first commission I got actually was out of nowhere. It just it just happened. It landed in my lap, and then things just started steamrolling after that. Every every year or so, I'd get a commission, and it was always a native piece of art. And the cool thing about that was, is it was the stuff that I was drawing already. So I had this rare opportunity that I was getting commissions of something that I was doing anyways. You know, something that that was authentic to me. I didn't have to uh, change who I was to make the extra dollar. Uh, it, it was it was me representing myself, and not only that, I was representing my people. You know, that people could go in and see my art, and they can see interpretations of what our culture is, where it's going, and that brings me to the title of the show: the continuation of Potawatomi culture. A lot of people don't realize this, but almost all Native American cultures were on the brink. And, and the things I'm going to say here right now, I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty. I'm not accusing anybody here of, of anything. Right? This is all things that happened in the past. Everybody can learn from the past and move on into the future. But we were on the brink of losing our language. We were on the brink of losing our entire culture. It was against the law to speak the language. It was against the law to dance. The very act of dancing was looked at as a form of uprising against the government. It was it was banned and outlawed. You and admittedly it was it was enforced differently across the United States depending on where you were, what the BIA was like in your area, or the, you know. It, but it was there, it was on the books. You couldn't do it. You had this whole generation, my, my grandmother's generation, not my great grandmother, my grandmother's generation, they were legally persecuted. They were legally made to give up their culture. Then you have my mother's generation. That's the generation that started to wake up and they started to ask questions and bring some of the things back. My grandmother's generation, most of them were embarrassed to even say anything or express any idea of what their culture was. You know, they, that sometimes if somebody from my mother's generation went to their parents, they were afraid to tell them anything. They might have to go to another uncle or something to get a piece of information to put it together. My generation, I'm 50 now, I'm the first generation that was raised with it from the get-go. There was no, I'm gonna discover I'm Indian today. We, we were here, we're doing it. My mother made sure I was there. My uncle would make sure that, like, there was times when I was in middle school where it's Friday and I'm singing on the drum. My uncle's teaching me how to sing on the drum. My uncle Clarence is teaching me how to sing on the drum. He made the drum. I'm getting off of school Friday, and instead of getting on the school bus, my uncles are coming to pick me up from Dickinson Middle School, and we're driving straight to Oklahoma for a powwow, right? That's how I grew up. Like, all these, you know, all the other kids in school, they might have been doing sports or other activities. I was very extremely lucky enough to experience my culture from the get-go. It formed who I am and where I'm going. Now, if you look at how that culture almost disappeared and where it is now, you can look at what I'm wearing, okay? If you go back and look at old historical photographs of Potawatomi or any Native American tribe, they're not dressed like this, like not even close, right? There might be some elements that look similar. There might be some pieces that might even look exact. But the, the big change is that since we're recreating, we're also growing. We are a surviving culture. If you're surviving, you're always evolving and growing and adopting new things. You have to do that to be a living culture. It would be very easy for me to go look, go to the Smithsonian, find an old black and white photo of one of my relatives and dress exactly like them. But that's reenacting. It's not authentic. I'm reenacting. I wouldn't want to do that. I want to be who I am. I want to carry my culture into the future, right? There's, in these paintings, you're going to see strings from the past, but you're going to see where it is now where I brought it. And I don't want to take full credit for this. Everybody in our tribe, everybody in every tribe that has any hand in the culture is doing some form of this. It might not be through artwork. It might be through song. It might be through politics. It, who knows, you know, but it, it's definitely always changing and evolving, and that's how you know that we're a surviving culture. That's why I don't feel sorry about the past and what happened to my family. It was regrettable, but I don't let it anchor me down because I'm too focused on trying to make sure that my kids coming up after me are going to have even more benefits than I had that what my mom provided for me and that what her mom provided for her. You know, there's another artist here, Jason We saw. I don't mean to put him on the spot. He's constantly pushing the limits on what Native American art is. And you have to do that. You have to do that as a living, breathing culture. You have to push yourself. 
And yeah, you might have some things that might get repeated, or you know, like maybe maybe you find a dead end and you might have to rethink where you're going to go with the next project. But it's that always that constant push to try to be new. And I don't think this just applies to Native Americans. I think this can apply to any culture, any culture. You should always just push yourself to be the best you can be, the best you can do. And even if it's you know ends up missing its mark, you should still try. You should still try. And I just want to say thank you very much. This last year has been so <clears throat> so amazing for me. I've had so many things that happened to me just this last year, art wise. And I have so many things coming up this year. I can't thank everybody enough because I can produce the art and I can show it to people, but if they don't respond to it and support me, I don't move forward. And I just want to say thank you all for coming out here. Uh, thank you for experiencing my culture that I'm putting on display here. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to come up and approach me. If I'm talking to people, just come on and jump into the same conversation. Thank you very much. Um,